This week on A Lively Experiment, it's Carmageddon on Route 195 West. We'll look at the political and practical fallout. And what are the House Speaker's priorities for the new session? A Lively Experiment is generously underwritten by... Hi, I'm John Hazen White, Jr. For over 30 years, A Lively Experiment has provided insight and analysis of the political issues that face Rhode Islanders. I'm a proud supporter of this great program and Rhode Island PBS. Joining us on the panel this week, Ian Donis, political reporter for The Public's Radio, retired URI political science professor Maureen Moakley, and Brown University political science professor Wendy Schiller. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jim Hummel. You no doubt got the jarring alert on your phone Monday afternoon, the sudden and unexpected closure of the westbound lanes of Washington Bridge in Providence has created chaos in the East Bay and Providence for much of this week. But it's not just the East Bay that's been affected. Drivers seeking alternate routes have jammed the Newport Bridge, and high school sports between the East Side and the state and anywhere else have been canceled, at least for now. Ian, you were at the press conference on Tuesday. They've been doing these every day, and it's we're taping on Friday morning, so we should say uh, the the they've opened up two westbound lanes. I actually went over them to get here, so things have changed. But man, what a week this was! Yeah, I mean, it was kind of the best of times, the worst of times, to quote Charles Dickens. Uh, maintaining roads and bridges is a very basic function of government. It affects people in their daily lives. Lives if there's terrible traffic congestion, as there was this week. So it's no surprise that people were angry and upset and looking to place blame. As you say, the bypass lanes were opened within four days, well ahead of the ori original two-week timetable set by DOT. So that's pretty impressive. And Governor McKee had a very mixed week. At first, he was out of sight on Monday. He raised his visibility by Tuesday, remained very visible. He got very, he flew off the the handle at Brian Crandall from Channel 10 when Crandall asked a very legitimate and reasonable question. And then a day later, the governor and, uh, was much more conciliatory. So, you know, it's been all over. But, you know, I think if traffic flows more smoothly, now that the bypass lanes have been open, the worst of it appears to be over. And that's to be determined. How were things in Providence? Was there a lot of backup near you? Well, there was, I mean, there were a lot of police officers trying to help direct flow of traffic. There are two main streets. Uh, one's called Gano, Gano Tabor, and one's Angel. And things were slow but moving. Um, they were flowing, and they re uh, they retimed the traffic lights so that Angel Street kept moving. So if you were trying to go across these streets, it took a little longer. But generally speaking, it was flowing. It wasn't like a dead stop. What about the governor's response? Well, How I mean, I think I think the sort of you know the governor has to decide. Right. Uh, does he want to be someone who's perceived as really, you know, 24-7, really working on this job, working hard, you know, not just sort of uh, opening things or being there um, in, in ways that are considered superficial, uh, but really monitoring what his agencies are doing and really being on top of things and asking for reports. And he was a mayor. I mean, I think he has an interest in these n really nuts and bolts or concrete things, but he doesn't show that. I don't think that's really what people perceive him as. And now I think he's going to have to shift gears if he really does fully to intend to run for re-election. It's two years away, three years away, but still. And he has to recognize that reporters have an obligation to report on the functions of state government. I mean, Jim, you and I have both been around for a long time. We've covered a lot of governors. I think the governor does have a tendency to be testy when asked tough questions. This has happened with me. It happened with Ed Fitzpatrick from The Globe. And, uh, you know, but he did course correct by Thursday and strike a more conciliatory tone. Yeah, I think he did course correct. But I do agree in the beginning he was not there and he was in town. And uh, Peter Alaviti was the one that had to, you know, he was a technical person and he should have been talking about it, but the governor shouldn't have been there. I mean, in other words, he was right around and he should have gone to the site. I mean, this was, I mean, this event, I'm trying to think, this is like, have we had anything like it? No, and the thing is, and he was in town and he just sent, he shuffled it off to Peter Alaviti, but then he sort of came back at the end. But I agree with Wendy, he's going to have to change his persona, his leadership perspective, because he goes to all these like a ribbon cutting and all those things, these sweet things, but tough stuff. He seems to shy away. He doesn't show. He hasn't been showing this year some strong leadership, and he's 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 kind of rebounded now. He's doing these you know daily broadcasts or 
the briefings, about, yeah. about what's going on. Going on. But I, I think he's um, he's got to project a very different um, persona or a leadership style. Or if explain, he's gonna... explain it better, right? Yeah. So, so one thing is that, you know, obviously Gina, you know, was everywhere all the time and mm -hmm. also, you know, ha most of the time chose very good people to run her, you know, administrative department. So in housing, for instance, Stefan Pryor has been the big exposed person on housing. Alvidi is an engineer, so he's been doing this a long time. So in some ways, you want a governor who picks good enough people who are at the helm that he lets them do their job. And that is something that he should be taking credit for by saying, I know you want me here, but I trust these people and they're really good at their job and I'm not going to interfere with what they're doing. That's a, that's a stance he could have taken. And I would recommend trying to take that stance in the future. And what's the You're first thing that Brett Smiley said? I apologize. I am so right. sorry for all. Of, it's not his fault. But, I mean, that, that immediately got him bonus points with everybody. Yeah, that goes a long way with the public when people are frustrated about being stuck in traffic for hours. You know, there are times when government can seem really remote, aloof, and yeah. uncaring about mm -hmm. the concerns of day-to-day -day people. So that does go a long way when someone like Mayor Smiley apologizes. I think Wendy's point is well taken that, you know, governors, mayors do have responsibility to delegate uh, part of the functions of government. But it's same time during a major crisis, and this was certainly a major crisis, the governor is the leader of the state, and he or she, whoever it is, needs to be front and center. And, and kudos, a quick kudo just to the Providence Police Department, because it was really cold yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, and they were standing outside for the most part, mm -hmm. trying to direct traffic, getting pedestrians safely cross crossings. They were all over the place, and it was a cold day, and that's one thing you want to credit the police commissioner and the mayor of Providence for doing, is really being on top of that uh, very quickly. The one thing I will say is, and, and Ian, we've gone to enough of these things, they do the live, especially during COVID, they were doing the briefings and breaking in. I would say to the governor, if I was at that press conference, it's a two-way street. We're giving you the airwaves. For, not, for, I mean, they're people's airwaves, right? But we're blowing out all programming on radio, TV. You take our questions, even if you don't like the question, you don't have to answer it, but don't go off on us on how to do our job. And I just think there was a tin here, and I think somebody got a hold of him. But as I was listening to that back and forth, I thought, what is going through his mind that he thinks it's an that's beyond the pale, it's inappropriate, it's like, it's... it's well, when he won, and he was told that uh, Helena when, Banana folks when was on the line, when he won called, that right? primary... Um, we can all say he wasn't particularly gracious about that. He kind of flew off and had a, had a casual kind of cutting remark about that. And, and then he recovered. And so he just has to figure out between now and the, and the, and the time of re-election, if mm -hmm. he runs, how to not do that anymore. What's, yeah. going to be, what's going to be interesting, Maureen, is so they under-promised and over-delivered. We've mm -hmm. got it done in four days, which mm -hmm. was great. I got the alert on my phone this morning. Um, Will this take, we're going into the dead of winter, and are bridge people going to be out there in four degrees and 50 knot winds? They're going to lose days. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out over the next three months. Will they get it done in a month, five months? What? Right, right. And it will be interesting to see. And, uh, you know, the governor has had a bad year in terms of a lot of missteps. And I think this is one more. And he's, he's got to go on a course correction. I mean, I could list all the things that he, you know, the Cranston Armory, the not paying attention to the appointment to the Ethics Commission. I mean, he's had some faux pas. So he's going to have to regroup and, and show some leadership. I just wanted to say one other thing, a little pitch here. I wonder if people could be more supportive of mass transit. I like Peter Olivetti, but I don't get why. I know it's an investment, but they don't put more money into buses. I love the idea of ferries. I mean, I don't know if that would work. But uh, we have We're going to find out Monday because yeah, they're launching a 500-passenger yeah, ferry. But it's cold, you know, but I mean, but the thing is, I think, I wish people could rethink, given this business, how we need more mass transit, and we really have to use it. I One think. other note, I think we should note that, you know, the uh, tr potential catastrophe was averted this week. I think it'll take longer to mm -hmm. assess whether the analysis from Governor McKee and Director Alvidi is correct that in July there was not an indication that things were this dire. You know, parsing whether that, uh, you know, st stands the test of time will we'll take a little longer to figure out. Okay, we've been talking for several weeks about the unrest on college campuses uh, after the, uh, the, the war 
uh, in Israel. And Wendy, we have talked about this on and off camera many times that you believe that students are responsible for their actions. Now, the first go around, the kids who got arrested, the, those charges were eventually dropped. Well, this this movie is playing again. Forty one kids more are uh, arrested now. So it puts Brown in a funny situation. It sounds like they're going to get serious and move forward with prosecutions on this one. I, I don't know what their plan will be, but I think it was predictable that if you drop the charges, on doing a certain protest activity that people will do it again. And I think they knew that. I think they were ready for it. And what's what's interesting to me is that they made sure that all of them were processed inside University Hall. There were no photo ops, right? There was no leading the students out in handcuffs so they could become right, exactly. sort of That's more well-known in the protest. They did it all inside. They prearranged that with the Providence Police Department. Because they that also, would fuel the fire as martyrs? Exactly, right? exactly. And they also didn't, I think, you know, um, I know the Providence uh, a Police Commissioner was on a news pro program last weekend and asked about sort of the inconvenience of having to come to campus, arrest all these students, and then have the pro ch charges dropped. And he basically said, uh, we'll do our job whenever we're called. But this time, the university made sure that the police department could do that without being as inconvenienced. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think they're doing the best they can to make sure that students do have the right of free speech. But free speech cannot uh, interfere with the operation of a business or an educational institution or any kind of public entity. You know, you can speak, but you cannot interrupt daily business operations. That is not your constitutional right. Just before I get to you, Maureen, I, it's a relatively small amount, but clearly there's this ripple because of all the media. Do you get the feeling, is it getting in the way of day-to-day -day business, of classes and other things going on? Or? I think when students and faculty and staff uh, feel less safe, whether it's intellectually less safe or it's physically less safe, no matter what their origin is, whatever their, their opinions are, I think it interferes with the process of learning. You can't learn as well if you are distracted by concerns of safety. And I think the university, Brown University, uh, Columbia, Harvard, all of these places will have to grapple with that. And when we come back in the spring, I, I do think there'll have to be changes so that we all, I'm teaching, I want to feel safe and I want all of my students and all faculty and staff to feel safe. Yeah, I just want to add one thing about that. Um, first of all, everybody likes to pick on the Ivies. You know what I mean? I mean, it's kind of shed and fred in the sense that uh, they like to sock it to them. So they're the ones that were up there. And um, I do think those congressional hearings were a political stunt. In other words, they walked into this trap and, but it was uh, a disaster. And it was a disaster. But the presidents were overcoached. They were overcoached. Because they were told stick to the line right. and they and didn't they think did. common sense. No, they didn't. And I, un they didn't do the right, have the right response, but it was a trap and they, it was a political stunt and it continues to be a political stunt because they're going to, re now they're going to reinvest, re investigate these institutions. As far as Brown is concerned, I think they've got, they're in a very difficult bind and I think they've managed it fairly well. I mean, they have, almost a quarter of their uh, student body is Jewish and they've got you know we have this we have this um, generational thing where a lot of young people see the uh, Israeli Jewish um, the Israeli Hamas thing in terms of human rights and the older people are less inclined to support that so in addition to this tendency to look at uh, the Gaza thing in terms of human rights we had this student that was shot, you know, up in Vermont, and he was Palestinian. And I think this created a very, very difficult situation for them. And I think they've done a really good job of trying to maintain some sort of a balance between free speech and doing something about, um, you know, stepping over into disrupting things that are going on. It's been noted that, you know, while these protesting students get a lot of news attention, the majority of students are not protesting. At the same time, I thought Bob Walsh had a very good analysis on this issue on this show two weeks ago, saying that there is an honorable tradition of civil disobedience, but if there are no penalties for breaking the law, it really doesn't mean anything. And, you know, I think the protesting students are very sincere in their beliefs. Uh, certainly these are issues that have galvanized concern across the world. It's a very uh, tough issue. This conflict has been going on for decades, but um, I, I thought the Wendy's analysis is very good.
Yeah. I thought that's why I asked you day to day, because it's not like a protest is breaking out in front of your class, but it's on everybody. Well, it could. It could. No, no, but I'm saying for the vast majority of people, it could. But if, if that's on your mind, and particularly if you're a Jewish, and we've heard this from the Jewish students who don't feel safe on campus, which is that whole, we, we joke around that it's some of the this generation's a little soft and we need safe spaces. Mm -hmm. But there's something to be said for that. College campuses relatively are, well, this is a place we can discuss and we can, at the end of the day, we can go out and have a beer together. It, it doesn't feel like that anymore. No, I mean, for some people. <clears throat> no, I mean, I, I think that's right. And there are two different issues. One is, does Brown divest from any company doing business, not only with Israel, but with any company that does business with Israel. So that's a very complicated thing to do in a world that's so globalized. I protested against South Africa sanctions when I was in college in the 80s and said we should divest from my university. But in those days, it was a little easier. It wasn't as global an economy. It's a very difficult thing to accomplish. So then the second thing and is, And there of wasn't course, social media. Right. And then, of course, the thing is calling for a ceasefire. I think everybody wants the violence to end against all parties in the Middle East, right, in, in Israel, Gaza, and Palestine. I mean, it just, we want it to end. Um, but can the university make that happen? No. And so universities have to ask themselves, do we want to be in the business of making statements on international conflicts? Because you can't really affect that international conflict. So you're making a statement, and where does that statement go? Places like, I believe, Yale and I believe the University of Chicago have not made any statements and said that's not our mission. And so I think this is a reckoning that's a broader conversation for universities. What did you make of Penn's uh, president resigned, Harvard's kept her job? Well, I mean, um, I don't understand. Penn went very fast, and I, I, I understand it's up to the board. And I think for some reason or other, a hundred million yeah, dollars. Yeah, hundred million dollars. Hundred million dollars, yeah. and that's unfortunate. You know what I mean? But a hundred million dollars is a lot of money. But I'm happy that Harvard stuck, you know, stuck to supporting gay. And I'm happy that um, that, that they, you know, they acknowledged that we, there were problems, but they weren't going to back down. And here, the faculty and the, the faculty and students, a lot of people supported her and wrote letters about it. And I think, I think it's, she should stay. I don't think they should be bullied into firing these people. All right, All right. to be continued, um, House Speaker Joe Sicarci did the media rounds uh, the last couple of weeks talking about his priority. We're going to have our special legislative show right after the first of the year. We'll hear from um, the House and Senate minority and majority leaders. But Ian, you sat down also with <clears throat> Speaker Sicarci, and it was interesting. Well, you give me your analysis, and then I'll react to what you say. Well, I think two of the major issues are housing and the economy. Um, Sicarci made the point that the package of housing bills passed by the General Assembly this year, most of them, the bills become effective January 1st, 2024. So he's you know, saying if people are complaining about a lack of progress on the housing issue, stay tuned. At the same time, it's obviously a long-term issue that's going to take many years to improve, if at all. And on the budget, we know we're coming into a tougher climate. The General Assembly has kind of been living in fantasy land for a number of years, thanks to the spigot, or the gusher, rather, of federal COVID aid. That's drawing to a close, and there's a more austere budget environment coming. So Shikarchi is kind of damping down expectations about the state's ability to fund as much things have been funded in recent But that recent recession years. everybody was talking about, it's like, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Maybe it's not coming. Yeah, no. No, I think the focus, particularly on, on your work already on this, uh, on the legislative agenda, is that um, we don't need a recession for that. We had a lot of extra money from the federal government that is, is either spent or going to dry up. Mm -hmm. So then you still have those same pressures, particularly on social service programs, which are federal pass-throughs, but still you still have a budget problem when you've been flush with money. Um, and so I think that's the issue. For me, the, the big question is, can the legislature get the assault weapon ban passed this time around. And I hope that you ask uh, Senate President Ruggiero about that. Um, and we'll see what Don't can happen. Don't hold your breath. Right. right. So, yeah. I, but I, I do think that there are bigger concerns given what happened in Maine and just thinking about personal safety. Because for the next year, things are going to get rough politically. And I think things are going to ratchet up. And I think people want to feel as safe as possible. So I wonder if more momentum builds, not necessarily for a ban, but maybe just additional limits on using those kinds of weapons.
And the president actually has started this process where he's c campaigned with, within the states because he said it's never going to happen at the national level. And people are signing up for that. It's a, it, I can't remember the name of the initiative, but the idea is to go to all these states and push for a ban on assault yeah. weapons. Yeah. And that may be a good thing. I thought Jakarci was, I heard your excellent interview, I thought Jakarci was very, in, uh, you know, uh, articulate, he was very clear. And candid. And candid, very candid. And he talked about um, this is the year for labor. In other words, they're going to get repeat, you know, police reform. And the other thing, when you asked him about uh, future offices, at whether he was going to run again, and the adage is that um, speakers of the House aren't good politically and they're, it's, an end, it's an end game because in other words, they play an inside game, they make a lot of tough decisions. And who really knows them statewide? Yeah, well, this is my point. I think that Chikarchi is playing an outside game. He's out there, he's at everything, he's willing to talk, he gave several interviews and I think that makes the difference between, you know, what used to be, like Mattiello and, you know, Carullo, they never talked, and this guy who's out there all the time. So I think he may have a political future. Yeah, he is sitting on a huge campaign account of well over a million dollars. He communicates very effectively, and he was very clear in saying that, no, he does not view the speakership as a terminal position. Uh, so he is certainly worth keeping an eye on, and I think the final chapter in show... Shikarchi's political career is uh, far from being written. You know, we've all we've talked about the budget every year. So five years ago, it was 9.4 billion. I know the COVID money inflated a lot of that. We're up to 14 billion, and it was one of the uh, debates that you moderated with Ashley Kalis and Dan McKee. And somebody said, you know, when all this ARPA money drives up, what's ultimately the budget going to settle in at? Because they have to, it all has to pass through. <clears throat> and the, the governor said $11.5 billion. Well, the budget last year came out at 14. So does it go back at some point? Does it have to go back? I think it will have to decline in the total spend uh, just because of the presence of less money. That would uh, not be the trend that has been set over many years, as we know, where the overall budget, including which includes federal dollars, has risen steadily. But I think I think it's almost inevitable that the overall total would go down. But right. I don't know how much. You know, I, don't I think guess we'll find out back. when they release yeah. it, and it, it may be next year that it's mm -hmm. when it really falls out. Okay, one more thing I want to get to before outrageous and kudos. Um, it broke after we taped last week. Uh, Peter Narona, the AG, has had this public spat with uh, Judge Daniel Procassini over some tweets that he did. You, you all know the story by now. Maureen, at first blush, the AG and the judge, we normally don't see these things spill out into no. the public. No, Actually, you know, it's interesting. I think very highly of Peter Narona. I think he's done a great job. He's gotten into some of these civil things. You know, the Block Island settlement and a lot of the Opioids, hospitals. Yep. He's doing a lot of really, really good things, and I admire him. However, I think that tweet was way out of line. He impugned the integrity of the court, and Procassini is a straight up guy. Mm -hmm. He's very respected. And he, he implied that he, Procassini, people judge shop for him. Because, because he's, he's soft. He, he, he's soft, and he's not. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, they talked about he's the guy that does all the bench trials. Well, he does jury trials and bench trials, and it was really insulting to his in, in, integrity. It's hard and, to put things in context in 280 characters, isn't it, Wendy? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean I'm, I, I'm not as prolific as Ian on Twitter, but yeah, but then I think about the parallels to what um, the Democratic Party is doing in terms of Re President Trump and gag orders against what he can say against prosecutors and judges. And I think we have to have consistency at all levels of government and say, you know, judges are independent and um, uh, um, impartial, and it, we trust that system. Mm -hmm. doesn't always work out exactly as it should, but it was disconcerting, especially using Twitter as that venue. And I think he's done a lot, and the more he puts himself in the public eye these days with Fernarona, the less good press he's getting. Yeah. So I'm thinking he's got to switch tactics if he really is serious about challenging McKee for, for right. the governorship. This has been an unusual fight, and Narona has been conspicuous in his use of Twitter or X this year. Interestingly, he's avoided appearing in a 
courtroom to answer Procassini's uh, anger on this issue, uh, the optics of which might not help the future political fortunes of Nerona, although the judge was very eviscerating in his comments last week, and now the whole issue has been kicked to the, uh, the disciplinary panel for the state Supreme Court. And, and he kind of doubled down. Yeah. He said, I have a First Amendment right. I'm fighting for you. It's almost like, you know, I'm the victim here. It just, it was kind of it had was, a weird you know, feel to it. I think his motor is running a little fast. I think because maybe he's out there and he's thinking about running, but he does such a great job. I mean, he, he's done a wonderful job as a general. Well, he got general. pretty bad press most recently in the Pro Joe about turnover. Uh, in the in office. This, in the That's, office, yeah. right? But people, you know, Amy Klobuchar got derailed because there was a bad article about her staffing. I mean, yeah. this stuff can derail you. So either figure out your PR operation mm -hmm. um, or go back to basics, one or the other, and then look around the landscape and see two years is a long time. All right, let's go to outrages and or kudos. <laughs> Mr. Donis, let's begin with you this week. I don't think it's a secret that finding a primary care physician in Rhode Island or even Massachusetts <laughs> has gotten harder and harder. My colleague Lynn Arditi recently reported on a study showing that if things are not changed, that by 2030, 200,000 Rhode Islanders could lack access to a primary care physician. That's not a good situation, and this is one of the serious health challenges that we as a state face. So, And that's what the legislature is going to have to look at because of the reimbursement rates. That's mm -hmm. been a complaint for many years. Mm -hmm. Maureen, what do you have? Mine is sort of national. I, I'm trying to be nonpartisan, but I think this current move to impeach Joe Biden is really off the rails. It's such a distraction in terms of all the things that we have to deal with. And the Congress has been very, very, um, you know, they're not focusing. It's a revenge thing. They're not focusing on the issues. And I just well, the think Republicans say they have the goods, but they haven't really sh they don't know showed what the goods is, yet. Yeah. So, so I just think that's outrageous. I'm going to go back to the kudo I mentioned earlier. I, I think that the Providence Police Force and the police chief responded really well to a very difficult situation, particularly on the east side. But in general, this new police chief, um, uh, Perez, I, Perez uh, he took over for somebody who was well-established, who was very popular, very good in the media. That's a, those are a lot of big shoes to fill. Um, he's the first Latino, uh, I believe, police chief of uh, Providence. And he has been very steady state and really engaged with the community and really Really working hard on police constituent relations and I think we have to recognize that because we all want th that situation to improve and that's stuff that doesn't meet you know the house breaks and the crazy stuff that makes the media but there's a lot of work that goes on in the neighborhoods and what you had said the community and it seems like he's doing a lot of that stuff and th that really doesn't make the headlines it doesn't make the headlines and also on guns right he's as you know Clements was good on guns he's really working on that and community policing and trying to engage with people allows you to do holistic um, a provision of safety. And so it just seems that he, that I think he doesn't want a lot of attention, but I think we have to recognize that this is a tough job and tough shoes to fill. And I think so far he's done a, a you know, really good job. Okay, yeah. what a week it has been, folks. We appreciate you joining us. Ian and Wendy and Maureen, good to see you. And a special programming note, you know it's that time of year. This, this very panel will be back next week as we look at our year in review the highs and the lows, the only in Rhode Island moments. And we'll really re-roll the tape and see their predictions for this year. We'll see how accurate they were. If you don't catch us Friday at 7 or Sunday at noon, we are all over social media. We also archive all of our shows at ripbs.org slash lively, Facebook, Twitter. And if you, uh, if you like podcasts, wherever you get your favorite podcast, we are on it. We hope you have a great weekend. Again, join us back here next week with our year ender as a lively experiment continues. Have a great weekend. A Lively Experiment is generously underwritten by... Hi, I'm John Hazen White, Jr. For over 30 years, A Lively Experiment has provided insight and analysis of the political issues that face Rhode Islanders. I'm a proud supporter of this great program and Rhode Island PBS.